So overall, we've had a kind of um, reduction in some of the more energy intensive industries uh, around the world o over the past, um, you know, 12 months or so. Basically, if you look at purchasing managers indices or just overall kind of measures of economic activity, a lot of them have decelerated, whether it's China, whether it's Europe and even in North America. Um, but there's been a divergence. So some of the more service oriented um, areas or less industry rate sensitive areas have done really well, while some of those other areas that are either more capital intensive or more industry uh, interest rate sensitive, the Fed's tightening has kind of pushed those down pretty significantly. In this discussion, Lynn Alden highlights a shift in the global economic landscape, pointing out a reduction in energy intensive industries over the past year. She notes a divergence in performance between service oriented and industry sensitive sectors, influenced by the Federal Reserve's tightening policies. Alden predicts a continued period of disinflation, but raises concerns about the potential return of inflation in future economic cycles. Shifting to the broken state of the current monetary system, she emphasizes the limitations of the existing technological approach to money, which has led to a reliance on layers of abstraction. Alden suggests that the speed gap between transaction and settlement speeds has resulted in increased levels of abstraction, creating a vulnerable financial system. She remains optimistic about the future of money, expressing hope for improvements despite the current challenges. Alden discusses the historical context of the monetary system, highlighting the dominance of a few strong currencies and the struggles faced by countries with weaker currencies. She explores the impact of technology on financial borders and suggests that emerging technologies, such as Bitcoin and stablecoins, could provide alternatives to traditional currencies, giving people more options and potentially making the global money market more competitive. Let's dive into the video to hear her full thesis. So we are seeing this ongoing period of disinflation. Um, I think the concern though, so many people are, are focused on, can we get back down to 2%? I think the bigger question to ask is, okay, so we get back down to 2%, and then if we ease on that um, and we have another economic reacceleration cycle, as we, as we tend to do every few years, what stops that inflation from returning? Um, and so I, I still think we're in a more cyclical uh, inflationary period, like the overall kind of higher highs and higher lows. Like basically the, the 2020s are likely to have kind of just an overall structurally higher level of background inflation. But that's still a very wide band. And, and clearly right now we are still in a, a disinflationary cycle. Um, for the time being, just you know, partially due to the tightness of, of monetary policy. So I think it's broken, and and you know, you mentioned it's a downer, but actually I view it as optimistic in the sense that if we identify a problem, uh, it makes it easier to fix the problem. So I, I still have a hopeful view of the future of money, even though the present situation is rough. So the the way it's broken now is that we we've reached basically a local maximum. Uh, in, in basically our, our technological uh, approach of money, which is basically to say that ever since we entered the, the telecommunications era, so ever since we, we deployed the telegraph in the second half of the 1800s and you know, connected the world uh, in terms of communication, we created this really big speed gap between transaction speeds, which were now almost instantaneous, and settlement speeds, which back then were gold. And you know the, the, the process of shipping around and verifying gold is hard. And so basically we, that gap uh, result in larger and larger levels of abstraction. So we have base money, and then we kind of have all these layers on top of it, which allows us to just, you know, build more and more credit, more and more claims on it, and eventually become so untenable that if that ever crashes even a small percentage, uh, it, the system basically blows up. And so they just they just disregarded gold. Gold was too slow to kind of keep up in this telecommunication era, uh, even when the other system was having problems. And so now we're in an environment where um, there's 160 plus different currencies in the world. Those of us in the United States or Europe or Japan or Canada, we have some of the better currencies in the world. Our, our currencies go down pretty slowly in, in value. Whereas if you're in the long tail of dozens and dozens of other smaller currencies in the world, you're more likely to experience double digit inflation on a recurring regular basis. And there's dozens of countries in the world that have experienced hyperinflation in, in our lifetimes, let alone if you go back further than that. Um, and so because there's been that kind of um, that speed gap, countries have gotten very good at basically controlling their financial borders that, you know, money can only go out in, in a couple of ways. It can go out through ports of entry, it can go in through ports of entry, but they're, that's obviously very limited. It can go in and out through wire transfers, but they're fully controlled by 
government regulations so they can decide, you know, if I send dollars to, to say, a freelancer in Egypt, um, the Egyptian government and banking system determines how easy it is for that Egyptian to get a, a dollar account, uh, whether or not my dollars that go to them get translated into Egyptian pounds or get to hit them with dollars. Um, and so they, they get kind of stuck in these silos, which then allows um, kind of the people that are closer to the money source to continue siphoning away people's savings, uh, wages, and basically putting everyone on kind of an economic treadmill where they're kind of constantly trying to keep up. And so what's kind of interesting now is that going forward, some of these technologies get around those borders uh, and, and kind of make money more competitive again, basically gives people around all these different silos access to whatever global money they want. It might be Bitcoin. In, in some cases, it might be dollar stable coins, but it gives people kind of more options, that, you know, to kind of let the market play out. In this next discussion, Lynn Alden anticipates a gradual adoption of blockchain-based payments, suggesting that while direct blockchain transactions may remain low in the next decade, overlay layers like Cash App and centralized services will continue to dominate due to their convenience. She emphasizes the significance of blockchain payments for the roughly 3 billion people living in authoritarian regimes, addressing their unique needs for financial access and protest resistance. Alden likens the multitude of global currencies to arcade tokens, highlighting their limited relevance outside their borders and their susceptibility to hyperinflation. She encourages a dual approach, using local currencies for daily transactions while leveraging blockchain assets like Bitcoin and dollar stablecoins for long-term savings and value preservation. Alden prioritizes solving the store of value problem for individuals worldwide, with blockchain payments serving as an optional yet unstoppable medium for those facing obstacles in traditional financial systems. Well, so I think even 10, 20 years from now, the percentage of people making payments directly with blockchain uh, will be low. I, I think there'll still be people using a lot of these overlay layers, whether it's Cash App, whether it's any other kind of centralized service, often because they're convenient. I think where the payments aspect becomes useful is when you're blocked in some way, which to your point is not necessarily a big percentage of people on the surface. Basically, there are about 3 billion people in the world that live in authoritarian or semi-authoritarian regimes. So this is actually a pretty big total adjustable market, but the majority of them are not actively trying to buy things that they're blocked from or actively trying to protest or things like that. So the actual percentage that kind of run into enough friction to search out solutions um, is, is still fairly small, but I think that's disproportionately important to give them the tools that they need because that's that's how change happens. Basically, it's, it's it's not the percentage, just the magnitude they can have. But I think more importantly, the way to look at this is basically these 160 currencies are basically like arcade tokens. They're they're other than the dollar and a few others. They're mostly just relevant in their little borders. Um, most of them have hyperinflated within a say 50 year period, uh, or at least the, the weakest ones have dozens of them. Other ones just have structurally high average inflation or structurally uh, background problems of financial censorship. And the way to approach these is look, if you have to pay your taxes in those currencies, you pay your taxes in those currencies. Um, if you, you know, you, you can kind of use that system, but then you, you cash out of that system when you don't need it anymore. And you know, when you want to have something better, when you want to have Bitcoin, when you want to have dollar stable coins, when you want to have something else that is more useful to you, more more better for your long term savings than your local currency. Um, and so I think that for most people around the world, the store value problem is a bigger and more obvious and more immediate one to solve because in some sense, everybody has a store of value problem. Uh, in, in some countries, we, we stash wealth into like illiquid real estate because we don't know what else to do with it. Or, you know, most countries don't have the S&P 500. They have the weaker stock market. So they're trying to, you know, they're trying to figure out where to put their money, if not in fiat currencies. So for a lot of people, that store value aspect is, is kind of the more obvious one. And then the payment one is relevant because if you, personally run into a problem of making payments, which is most people I think are not going to run into, but the people that do, they now have that option, especially if they're already holding some of their savings in these more, you know, kind of uh, self-custodial or protected assets. Um, they can now from that stack, from that optionality they've saved up, from that store of value, they can make payments if they need to from what otherwise was blocked. And so I think that's the order of events here is basically that there's this optional payment medium that's not the most, usually it's not the most efficient, but it's the most unstoppable, but only a percentage need it. But then more and more people identify it as a really useful savings technology that should, again, should they need to, 
it then offers kind of certain payment services that are you can't really get with some of these centralized systems uh, at the cost of sometimes being less efficient. But if you're blocked from some of the more centralized things, that's when you're willing to turn to, you know, some of these other solutions. In today's insightful discussion with Lynn Alden, we've delved into the current state of the global economy, the challenges in the monetary system, and the potential role of blockchain technology in shaping the future of money. Lynn highlighted the reduction in energy-intensive industries, the divergence in economic sectors, and the ongoing period of disinflation. She emphasized the broken nature of the current monetary system, pointing to the limitations of the existing technological approach and the need for change. As we look ahead, Lynn discussed the evolving landscape of blockchain payments and their potential impact on financial borders. She addressed the store of value problem globally, offering a nuanced perspective on the dual approach of using local currencies for transactions and blockchain assets for long-term savings. If you found today's insights valuable, don't forget to subscribe to our channel, like this video, and share your thoughts in the comments below.